This is Wickham Sound. Hello everyone, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. My name's Dane Cobain. This is the show where we cover the local art scene, we cover what events we can, we get a little bit of local music on, and uh, we always try and uh, feature poets and dancers, actors, you name it, anything arty I want to hear from you. Uh, we also have a different guest on each week. And so this week we will be talking to Stephen Colgan, who has been a fellow presenter here on Wickham Sound. Uh, He's also a QI elf, um, but most importantly, he's an author and an artist as well. So he currently has some of his art on display here in High Wickham at uh, Wickham Art Centre at their Creativity During a Pandemic exhibition. Um, He is as well a a Wickham native, native, local. But uh, yeah, he's had an, an interesting old life. He used to be a policeman. He's written a few non-fiction books. And more recently, he's been writing a few uh, fiction novels, which are right on my street because they're kind of cozy. Well, they're quirky, cozy mysteries, which is what my books are as well. We both kind of, uh, I think, approach the same genre in a way, but from different angles and with like, I don't know, very, very different styles. But it's uh, cool to compare them, I think. So, yeah, we'll be talking to Stephen a little bit later on in the show. As always, you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. You can also find us on Facebook if you just search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. You can drop me a message there and I will get back to you. So part of the reason that I originally wanted to launch this show was to cover all the artsy things going on in and around Wickham. And I think the main thing to sort of talk about at the moment is the uh, creativity during a pandemic exhibition at the Art Centre. I mentioned that uh, Stephen's got a piece on display there. Uh, There's also uh, a sort of a spoken word corner where I have uh, an excerpt from one of my stories is playing there. Um, So I figured why not sort of share that here as well because it's not too long and uh, it saves me from having to ramble on about nothing for five minutes before we put the first song on I suppose. Hopefully I didn't break the uh, fourth wall too much there. So we're joining John McDonald who is the CEO of Sunnyvale Factory Farm as he's talking on a radio to Lieutenant Colonel Ben Runciman of the British Army. Uh, The Sunnyvale survivors are all holed up in the admin building and uh, we're learning a little bit more of the nature of the disease. Hello, McDonald said. Is anyone there? Sorry about that, Sunnyvale, Runciman replied. There was a shake to his voice, a genuine shake, and they could believe it. He sounded sorry. We we underestimated the animals and were taken by surprise. A dozen of my men were wounded. Several of them were killed. I'm sorry to hear that, MacDonald replied. Any idea what's going on? I was hoping that you could tell us. That's a big negative, MacDonald said. We're still working on it. Tom Copeland, our vet here, thinks there's something wrong with them. Some disease or something. That's as much as we've got. What's the situation on your end? The quarantine's still holding, Runciman said. So far, at least. But we've moved people away in the surrounding areas. Just as a precaution, you understand. Honestly, I've never seen anything like this. I'm surprised you guys are still going. We've had our moments, MacDonald admitted. Thinking about the employees he'd lost since the outbreak and the faint splash of gore and viscera across the grass below the gantry where the remains of Greg Hamsey were still lying out there in the darkness. What's wrong with the animals? We don't know, Runciman said. The best I can give you is a guess. That's more than we've got, MacDonald replied. Give me the bad news. There was a pause for a moment and MacDonald found himself struggling with a troubling thought that they might have lost contact again. The signal was weak at best and the incoming storm was playing havoc with it. But then the voice filtered back through again and MacDonald realised that Lieutenant Colonel Ben Runciman had been stalling for time. The disease is complicated, Runciman said eventually. We're still carrying out analysis in the lab, but we're working on the basis that it's a hybrid of COVID-19 and foot and mouth. It certainly resembles it in the early stages. MacDonald's head whirred around on its shoulders like he was Reagan McNeil and the Exorcist until his eyes alighted on Tom Copeland. He beckoned the man forwards and gave him the handset. Tom Copeland here, he said. Sunnyvale's veterinarian. Did you say foot and mouth? Aptheia pizzuticae and coronavirus. That's correct, Dr. Copeland, Runciman said. Only it's a mutation from hell. It has an incubation period of a week or so where no symptoms are present and the beasts pass on the infection. Always a problem where large numbers of animals are gathered in a single place. But Aptheia pizzuticae only affects animals with a cloven hoof, Copeland said. And whatever the hell this is, it's affecting all of them. Like I said, Runciman told him, it's a mutation from hell. After the incubation period, 
the animals come down with a fever and start to get blisters inside their mouths. Classic foot and mouth to begin with. But then the virus changes, and it's only at this point that we can tell the two apart. The first stage is a coma, unlike any coma we've seen before. The heart and the lungs stop functioning, and the brain goes into a kind of suspended animation. After a couple of days, the virus has wiped out memory, emotion, personality, and all that other stuff that makes an animal unique, until it's left with just the most basic drives. The desire to eat, sleep, drink, and reproduce. Sound familiar? It would explain why the animals are on a rampage, Copeland admitted. But we haven't seen any comas here. Unless... Unless what? We normally check the pens every couple of days for dead animals and ship them off to the crematorium, Copeland said. But what with one thing or another, we missed a check. Then there's your answer, Runciman said. If what you're saying is true, Copeland reasoned, an outbreak could have occurred without us knowing. Even if an animal was infected, we'd mistake it for dead and burn the body. But the crematorium has been quiet for a couple of days. And so the animals rose back up. I don't buy it, Copeland said. You're telling me that we're dealing with what? Zombie animals? Not zombies, Runciman said. They're... The signal cut out again, and John MacDonald took the opportunity to rush forward and to grab the handset back from Copeland. They waited for the signal to come back, but there was nothing, and so John MacDonald turned the dials and adjusted the frequency. It took them a while, but they managed to re-establish the connection on a higher frequency, but the signal was bad and they didn't hold up much hope that it would last for long. Actually die. What was that? MacDonald asked. Please repeat, we're losing signal here. Roger that, Sonny Vale, Runciman replied. Then I'll make this quick. You have to understand the nature of the animals. They're not dead or undead, at least in the conventional sense. Your boy's been watching too many movies. Those animals of yours are still alive. They're just behaving like mindless drones. They'll die just as easily as they would have died before the infection, only they don't feel pain. After the coma, the animals wake back up, but by then they've changed. They've turned into vicious, bloodthirsty killing machines. A chill seemed to settle over the Sunnyvale survivors, but perhaps it was just the wind from the storm as it drifted inexorably across the sky towards them. How is this disease transmitted? MacDonald asked. I was getting to that, Runciman replied. As far as we can tell, it's transmitted through the consumption of infected flesh or from a bite from another infected animal. The conditions are just right for the disease to spread. Okay, so that was an excerpt from my upcoming novel, Meat, which will hopefully be out later this year, hopefully just in time for Halloween. And now we're going to have a little bit of local music. Now, uh, this one I really enjoyed, actually. It's my mate Dave, who is not my mate Dave Ford, because I do have a mate called Dave, because I think everybody does, but a band called My Mate Dave. Uh, and they're a four-piece, and they do sort of folky songs, I guess. Um, they do a wide mix, because they've got, like, uh, ukulele, violin, banjo, a lot of cool different instruments. They do a lot of different sort of intermelding with their voices and singing in harmonies and stuff as well. And um, I think that's perfectly on display here because this is just an a cappella version of um, I'll Fly Away, which is cracking tune. I love that song. And I really enjoy their performance of it as well. And what I particularly like about this um, is that there is some a little tiny bit of wind because this is actually like, again, it's live and it's filmed on, uh, on an allotment. So rock the allotment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I like. I think it almost adds to the uh, to the tune because you can. It's like hearing crowd noise in a in a live performance, you know. Except crowd noise is obviously a thing of the past now. So yeah, this is my mate Dave with their a cappella version of "I'll Fly Away." One bright morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to that home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away I'll fly away Your glory I'll fly away In the morning When I die Hallelujah by and by I'll fly away When the shadows of this life have gone I'll fly away Like a bird from these prison walls I'll fly I'll fly away I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away In the morning When I die Hallelujah by and by so 
glad and happy when we meet. I'll fly away. Kick these cold shackles off my feet. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then. Where joy will never end I'll fly away I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away In the morning When I die Hallelujah by and by I'll fly away Love music, love talk, love Wickham Sound. Did you know there's a new council coming for Buckinghamshire? From the 1st of April, the new Buckinghamshire Council will replace the existing county and district councils. Don't worry, your bins will still be collected. We'll continue to run libraries, maintain the roads, look after vulnerable adults and children, and there'll be all the day-to-day -day services you are used to. One council will make it simpler for you. We'll be able to improve services together and give you better value for money. Buckinghamshire Council. Your Buckinghamshire, your council. A better future together. We understand that everyday life is going to become challenging over the next few weeks and months. But we want to reassure you that the Wickham Sound team are here to inspire and entertain you with local, relevant programmes and information. We followed government advice and set our team up to work remotely. We have taken all the steps we can to keep our team safe so we can be here for you. Local businesses. Perhaps you have closed temporarily or have found a new and innovative way of working. If you want to reach customers with your message, get in touch with us today. We can get through this if we all pull together. Please stay at home, stay tuned to Wickham Sound for the latest information and do get in touch with us to let us know how you're doing, if you'd like a song played or just want us to say hello to you. This is Wickham Sound. Sleepwalking, looking at my watch, the grind never stops. Sat on the sofa with snack, crackle and pop, no days off. Trying to keep it moving. In school, the teacher said that I was useless. Now I'm set to prove I'm wrong and make my movements. Fed up with feeling grey. There's dreams to be made, done letting the past eat away. Stacking for a rainy day. Now I've got a son, I need to pave the way. Back to that groundhog day, that same paper chase. The frost, the windows of my car. Fingers crossed, the engine starts. Hoping my petrol lasts another 500 yards. Can't be late again, that's a red card. I've got bills for days, I've got bills to pay. With a scrunched up receipt, some poor beggars lose change. Giving me the screw face. Tired and yawning. Late nights, early mornings. Feels like you're free falling. Is it ever gonna stop? Tired and yawning. Late nights, early mornings. Feels like you're free falling. Is it ever gonna stop? 
It's a new day but shit ain't changed I walk to work in the rain Plotting a way to escape Fed up of feeling grey I never made a profit Dusting my wallet So I dusted off my knowledge Another day in the office Then I'm back to the yard to kick back Don't forget the six pack Home comfort Shared with the riffraff Sit back Admire what we created I thought you might have faded We ain't going back to basics Saturday morning Late night Saturday morning Feels like I'm free falling is it ever gonna stop? Tired and yawning. Late nights, early mornings. Feels like you're free falling. Is it ever gonna stop? This is Wickham Sound. That was Morel with Late Nights, Early Mornings. And before that, we had I'll Fly Away by My Mate Dave. It's their outdoor live performance on an allotment. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. My name's Dane Cobain, and I am joined in conversation by this week's guest, who is the very talented, multi-talented, in fact, kind of a renaissance man, really, uh, Stephen Colgan. So over to Stephen. So uh, the first question that I ask everybody is, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? The very last book I wrote was Asterix and the Chieftain's Daughter. Oh, cool. (laughs) That definitely counts. It's it's the most recent of the Asterix book last year. And of course, it's by by the new team up because obviously Gaskini and Uderzo were both gone. We lost um, Uderzo earlier this year. Um, And they're they're okay. I mean, they're, they're a good successor to the original writer and artist they're not as good it must be said they're not as funny yeah but they're still they're still pretty good and um yeah it was a it was a sort of birthday present so um and that, that brought collection up to date which started in about 1976 Blimey, <laughs> the old wow. ones are really tatty now awesome. <laughs> i've actually been i've been meaning to try and read some of them um because i've been trying to practice my french so i've been trying to um meaning to get to one of them in the, the original french and to try uh, and read yeah that, but... you see i, I cheat i have it's funny i was having a conversation about this the other day because we, we had the french versions mm-hmm. in my school i think i've described you as a bit of like a renaissance man because you do a bit of everything but um so you mentioned your art and i think on your um your bio at the wickham art center i think you said is is art your sort of your first love it, it, it always was, but, uh, and in fact, when I was sort of 17, 18 and looking at what to do in terms of once I'd left the sixth form mm-hmm. of school, I did actually have a place at art college and I did have a place at a catering college because at the time I was working in a restaurant, yeah. chiffing. Um, and the problem was that people don't realise it when they go on holiday, but Cornwall's the poorest county in England. Mm. It, it's It's... It's lovely to visit for a holiday, but if you live there, you've either got to be very poor or, or quite rich, because if you're poor, the state looks after you, mm-hmm. and if you're rich, you've got, of course, you, you don't have to worry, but the, the in-betweens, the middles, it's a tough time, because there's very, very low employment, most of the employment is seasonal, so for about six, seven months of the year, you're unemployed, yeah. and this year, they've taken a really big hit with COVID, of course, mm, of course yeah. and um, so when you went to see the careers teacher when I was a, a lad, it, it wasn't what do you want to do. It, it was what's your plan for getting out of Cornwall. Yes, yeah. And um, I kept looking at people I knew who were brilliant artists who'd got to the end of the sixth form, gone off to what was then Polytechnic or Technical College, got got a degree in art, and were were building walls for Kerry District Council because there was no work in Cornwall, mm. and Cornwall's got more artists than Earwigs, as my dad used to say. <laughs> So you're all competing with each other, and unless you're very lucky and get into like one of the galleries in St Ives or something, you know you're never going to make any money from it. So it was with that thought and the fact that all my mates were going off to university in London, who'd done better than I had in their exams, um, I ended up having a, a desultory drink with my dad uh, to celebrate my 18th birthday. Uh, and my dad was a policeman mm-hmm. um, specialising in homicide, a detective, and. Um, we got into one of those, you know, what are you going to do with your life type chats. And by the end of the evening and, and many, many pints, I'd, I'd somehow taken on a bet. I'd, I'd, I'd accepted a bet from my dad that I wasn't man enough to be a cop for six months. Right. So I ended up giving up my college places and joining the police in London for six months, uh, which turned into 30 years. 
but it was great because my best mates were all in London. They'd all come up from Cornwall. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm still best mates with them now to this day. They're all working in and around London. And, um, and I ended up having a, a very rewarding 30 year career and the art sort of got pushed into the background. Yeah. But now that I'm a bit older and I've got a, you know, I'm a bit more settled in, you know, sort of finances and mm-hmm. those sorts of things. I don't have to chase the work anymore. Um, I've gone back to it and I've, I've been really, really enjoying it. Really Amazing. enjoying it again. And and so uh, that's kind of led me to your f- sort of one of the questions that I wanted to ask. So um, because with your with your books, you've obviously you've got quite a mix. So you've got some non-fiction and you've got fiction as well. Um, but obviously, um, so you've written about your life uh, as a policeman, and and also obviously you've got that sort of crime element in your um, what I'd call your sort of cozy murder mystery stories. Was, yeah, was it yeah. was it a conscious thing to write what you know, or were you just is that just what you were sort of attracted to? I don't know whether it's a, a conscious thing because I mean the, the, the thing that's the thing that always makes me laugh is, is when people think that murder mysteries have anything to do with policing. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they are called crime fiction for a reason. I can't watch I can't watch cop shows on yeah. TV because all the procedures wrong and everything's a nonsense. You know, and there's so many tropes that are built into them that are totally untrue. You know, things like. Um, you know, good cop, bad cop. Yeah. You can't do that because that breaks the rules of evidence. Yes, that's TRS. Yeah. You know, and you can't smother. I'm sorry, but you can't smother a conscious person with a pillow. Yeah. Um, because the fibers are. All you do is turn your head sideways. Anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't draw chalk outlines around bodies because we've got cameras. You know, <laughs> things like this. It's um, there's there's so much that just drives me nuts. And when you see the technology the police officers use on TV, I mean that's just madness. Mm-hmm. When I left the Met in 2010, they were still using Windows 95. You yeah. know, it's it's <laughs> it's that bad. But um, there's no investment in it. That's why you see public services is never any investment. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but I've always loved reading murder mysteries because they're nonsense. Yeah. Because they're fiction. Because they're silly. Because you know I, I've been involved in a lot of real life investigations. Some of which have been to do with homicide. You mm. know, and you don't catch the murderer by seeing mm, the candles burnt down slightly further than I thought it would have yes, been. Yes. Yeah. Or this sort of thing. It's just good solid detection work, forensics, and interview. You know. Um, so you so you've never gathered all the suspects on in one of, room. And romantic, them... fictional, silly quality, and I just wanted to sort of elevate that, turn up to eleven a bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and um, so I want to talk as well about um, about those mysteries, and because um, you mentioned your your father as well, so um, yeah, can yeah. you tell us a bit about how you, because you integrated part of one of his manuscripts into your novel, right? I did, yeah. I mean, Dad was very unfortunate, bless him. He, he had a heart condition all his life he didn't know about. And unfortunately, at the age of 51, pretty much just as he'd retired from his police career, yeah. he had a massive heart attack and, and died. Um, I said the age of 51, no age at all. I'm 59 mm. now, and it's quite terrifying to think, that, you know, what would, you know, how much, how much you miss in your life. I'm still, I'm, I'm still looking to years ahead yes, and all things yeah. I want to do yet. So to, to go at 51 is awful. But the one thing that Dad... Um, had always wanted to do. He'd had a lot of articles published in magazines and newspapers. He was a very competent writer, but he he would been construct he'd been constructing a novel, a murder mystery novel, very much in the style of um, Agatha Christie mm-hmm. or, or someone like that, Guy Marsh or, or someone like that. But, you know, quite sensible, quite serious. And this is don't forget this is pre-internet days because he died in 1991. Mm. Um, and so he'd done all the research, all the historical research, by writing to people and by going into libraries and things like that. And he'd, he'd amassed all the detail he needed, started writing, got four chapters in and died. And um, and the really sad thing about it is I've got quite a lot of his notes and I've got the four chapters in his original typewritten script. But mum insists, my mum insists that there was a little black book in which he noted down everything to do with the plot and that, and mm. we've never found it. Oh. And whether or not we will ever find it, I don't know, because my mum's moved house about five or six times yeah. since then. It may possibly be in a box in the attic that's just moved from house to house to house, I don't know, but the big problem was that it meant I couldn't finish the novel, because I didn't, know, although I had details of the characters and the setting and everything like that, I had no details of the plot or who'd mm. done it or whatever. So what I decided to do was, when I wrote A Murder to Die For, which was the first of the, mm-hmm. the novels, um, it's a comedy murder mystery that takes place at a murder mystery convention. Because I thought that was very funny in mm. itself, the idea that, you know, 
the, the, the victim, the witnesses, the, the, the murderer, everyone are all cosplayers. They're yeah. all dressed up as detectives, you know. So when you're saying, well, I think the you know the person who did it was dressed as Miss Marple. That could have been you know one of several twenty Miss Marple. Yeah, yeah. Um, but because I didn't want to use real detective books, um, it was all set around a fictional author who is very much obviously Agatha Christie, um, called Agnes Crabb. Mm-hmm. And there are several points in the plot where we get to read extracts from Agnes Crabb's novels. So what I did for those bits was I used extracts from Dad's unpublished novel. Mm. So it meant that at least, actually quite a substantial chunk of the four chapters he wrote actually ended up in print, yeah. which I thought was quite a nice thing to do. Mum was very happy. She thought it was a great idea. It's, it is. It's and, a nice tribute, I think. Well, the nice thing was as well, because Dad wrote very differently to me, mm. it, it provided a different voice. Yes. You know, so it's um, it didn't look like me trying to write like another writer. It actually genuinely was another writer who wrote the Agnes Crabbe segment. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, so one, it worked very well. Worked very well. One of the things I think is interesting as well. Um, so in the cover, you've got like um, there's like a bio of Agnes Crabbe and like a list of her published works and stuff. And so as you're reading it, you do actually feel as though she is just a you know a real person who had a real life and really did write these books. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I did want to set it up that that. By the end of it, people are thinking, what, what's this actually a real author? Yeah. I did actually have a couple of people say to me, I, I tried looking up some Magnus Crabbe books after I'd read it. Was she actually real or not? Because yeah. I, 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 that was very pleasing because it meant that I'd done my job properly. Yes. Oh, yeah, I did, I did come up with an entire bio for her. I'm, I'm more of a pantser than yeah. a plotter when it comes to writing. You know, I, I, it's a bit like turning the sat nav off. I know where I've got to go, but I'll meander my way there. Yeah. You know, I know what my destination is. I know what the, the, the denouement is at the end of the novel, but I, I go down all sorts of weird little trackways and lanes and things, exploring things before I get there. Yeah. Um, but in order for the plot to work, I had to have a very clear idea of Agnes Crabbe, where she lived, what her life was like, and what she'd written. Yeah. Because that that would set the tone for how all the fans reacted to each other. Yeah. Because one of, one of the other things that was quite fun was to have... Um, all these different fan groups and the rivalry between the fan groups, <laughs> yeah. which the idea came to me. I, I went to Comic Con in San Diego a few years ago, yeah. and, I, and I was standing. I was. It was very funny. I was standing in a queue, laughing at the guy in front of me trying to eat a burger who had Wolver, who was dressed as Wolverine. Right. <laughs> and he was trying to eat a burger without taking his own face off because he had these massive claws to hold the back of his hand. Yeah. And <laughs> but I was standing in this queue, and I suddenly saw this this little group, two or three guys dressed as tim burton era batman yeah being really snippy about a little group of people who were dressed as the adam west 1960s version of batman and robin and, and they're being really snippy about oh god look at those tights look at those yeah. underground oh god don't they look gay isn't it stupid and i thought this is brilliant this is batman having a go at batman yeah. and, and it suddenly batman. occurred to me then yeah there really is this fan club rivalry this whole you know people's front of judea judean people's front thing going yeah. on in real life yeah. So that added another element to the murder mystery and the fact that it was quite possible, and I'm not going to reveal whether it's true or not, but it was quite possible that part of this murder that takes place in the book is due to interfan rivalry, you know? Yeah. yeah. But it meant I had to have the Agnes Crab stuff correct. So um, cool. it was an unusual amount of research I did for this book that I don't normally do on yeah. background writing, but it worked out. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with Stephen Colgan. So it's time for a little bit of music now. So this is the new single by Persephone in the Underworld. We've played some of their stuff before. Uh, It's called I Want You to Panic, and they say here, Inspired by the remarkable Greta Thunberg, this is the second release highlighting the climate emergency we're all facing. As our government seems to continually fail us on all levels, this is the best time for us to rise and unite, to fight for our freedom and for the world we should all protect and nurture. We are rapidly running out of time to make a change before it's too late. We need to respond now and urgently. We need to panic. We need to act as if the house is on fire because it is. Let's check it out. I want you to panic. By Persephone in the Underworld.
That was Persephone in the Underworld with I Want You to Panic. My name is Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. And I'm here in conversation with author and artist Stephen Colgan. Having written some non-fiction before as well, I think most people would... You'd, you'd think you'd have to do a lot of research on the non-fiction, but I suppose a lot of your non-fiction as well is... It's sort of just stuff you know and come across, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a range of stuff. Uh, the first two books I wrote were all about interconnectedness because mm-hmm. at the time it was just the first book was published just before I started working on the show QI, TV mm-hmm. show QI, and I was already quite a sort of prolific collector of facts. And what I'd noticed was there were a lot of fact books in the shops, and my agent said you should write one, mm. and. Um, I thought, I don't want to be just another fact book. And what I'd noticed is that there were certain facts that linked to other facts. And I thought, maybe I'd do a sort of um, six degrees of separation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And that did mean I had to do quite a lot of research to try and find, you know, if I started, if my starting point was the number seven, was then finding lots of things associated with number seven. And then when you arrive at something like um, the seven colours of the rainbow, that bounces you off to, you know, both Pink Floyd's cover of Dark Side of the Moon. It also bounces you to Isaac Newton. It also bounces you to sort of um, uh, the use of the rainbow in flags for LGBTQ Mm -hmm. people. You know, all these different bounces and associations started happening. Um, And that's what led to the first two books, which were joined up thinking and connectoscope. So the research for that was just basically trying to find facts that associated with the other facts. Yeah. But yeah, you do find this stuff. But the, the other two non-fiction books, one was based on my police career and, and my view of how policing should be done. That mm-hmm. was one step ahead, uh, which is a lot about behavioral science and crime science and that sort of stuff. And the other one I co-wrote with Professor Sue Black. Um, who got an OBE last year, which is really nice. Um, and that was, she's the lady who started the campaign that saved Bletchley Park for the nation. Amazing. So the research for that was amazing because I got to meet quite a lot of veterans. Yeah. I got to go up to Bletchley Park a few times. I actually operated Colossus, you know, the first ever amazing. major. Wow. Um, I played with the bomb machines. I had to go on Enigma machines. So the research for that was very much more hands-on. Yeah. And it was brilliant. I'm sad to say a lot of the people I interviewed have now passed on because yes. they're all in the 90s. Yeah, when they I can imagine, them. yeah. This was back in, what, 2009, 10? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was a great book to work on because I just I just learned so much. I learned so much because it, it was a book about Sue's campaign and how it had saved Bletchley Park for the nation. Yeah. But at the same time, it told the story of why Bletchley Park needed to be saved yeah, what it important. actually did and we were particularly keen to tell the story that wasn't just about Alan Turing yeah. because they tend to focus on him as the kind of poster boy and quite rightly I mean he yeah. did extraordinary things but he was one of 10,000 people who worked there yes, yeah. and 70 to 80% of them were women and yeah. that story is never told and their story was hilarious it was brilliant it was funny and entertaining <laughs> and extraordinary um, you know and Tommy Flowers doesn't get the credit either Tommy Flowers is the guy who computerised code breaking he's the guy who created the world's first what we would call a programmable computer and he hardly ever gets talked about yeah. so it, it was a book of kind of you know bigging up Alan Turing and quite rightly so but also talking about the other unsung heroes yeah. particularly the women who just don't get any mention in other books yeah for sure Oh, okay, cool. And uh, so um, I want to move back to um, so your murder mysteries because so it was your as you said it was your birthday the other day, and um, it was, you yeah. you hit a milestone with your new release, didn't you? I did. You know I did. What a lovely day it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my wife bought me a nice little trip down to Cornwall in September to see the family. Mm-hmm. Stay at a nice cottage of and Paul's. I got me Asterix book. I got a couple of nice books about Tony Craig, who's one of my favourite sculptors, and um, I happened to put up on Facebook about. Oh, my book is 82% funded. It'll be such a nice birthday present to get it all the way there before my 60th birthday this time next year. And people just responded to it. And suddenly, before I knew it, bang, I was 100% funded. So the book's now going to happen. Brilliant. That was a lovely thing. And this is the third one in the trilogy because it started with A Murder to Die For. Mm -hmm. And then we had The Diabolical Club. And now this one's called Corrings. It's spelled mm-hmm. slightly differently to Corrings, yep. but it is called Corrings. We can't, we can't um, say on the radio how it's spelled. <laughs> well, I can, because I mean, <laughs> it is an actual English word. Yeah. It's, it's, not a, it's not a word in Houston. It's actually spelled C-O-C-K-E-R-I-N-G. And and the the, the, the job of cockering was building haystacks. Yeah. If you go back a couple of hundred years, mm-hmm. but as happened with a lot of families that had a slightly embarrassing bit of spelling in their name during the Victorian era, yeah. where things were a little bit repressed, people would actually pronounce it differently. Yeah. So you've got people, you know, it's like 
um, famously Coburn's Port. Yeah. If you go and buy a bottle of Coburn's Port, it's actually spelled Cockburn's on the, on yeah. the label. And um, I actually, actually, this all came about because I met a guy um, oh, about two years ago, three years ago now, and I had to write his name down, and he, he announced his name was his name was Trebilco. And I said, oh, how do you spell that? And I had my own ideas about how Trebilco was spelled, yeah. but it was actually spelled T-R-E-B-L-E-C-O-C-K, which is a treble cock. Yeah, yeah. And I said, e okay. And, he's, <laughs> and again, it, it's the same reason that, well, there's so many names like that that were just a little bit embarrassing, like Death. There was a lot of people who had the surname Death and, and started calling themselves Diaz yeah, and things yeah. like this. Um, and I, I thought, I can play with this. And so that became the name of the um, the family, the Corring family, uh, around whom the plot revolves in the new book. So. <laughs> It's quite funny. Yeah, delighted it's funded. It's quite funny because I've uh, I've actually done kind of deliberately done, done something similar in some of my books. So I've got uh, a Chumley who obviously like it looks like his name is Cholmondeley. Cholmondeley, and, yeah. And um and it's great because um a lot of my friends like make YouTube videos, so I get to watch a lot of American people who've never seen this name before just completely butcher it. And I kind of did it deliberately. <laughs> um okay, so a couple more questions to end on. Um so. Another thing I obviously want to talk about is you've got some um, sculptures on display at the Art Centre at the moment on the lockdown exhibition. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us the story behind them. Yeah, um, well, uh, the first sculpture, the thing that kicked it off was that um, I was seeing that other people were doing great things in lockdown. I mean, Grayson Perry um, did a fantastic um art club on channel four for a few mm -hmm. weeks which was just brilliant fun to join in with uh noel fielding uh, did a great art club online through twitter so did olaf falafel mm -hmm. uh, the children's book writer and comedian and and i thought i kept hearing so many people were saying i'm actually producing art now in lockdown because i'm stuck in the house and mm -hmm. i thought do you know i fancied doing something i fancied doing something and, and i set myself the challenge because I, I i had sort of a part sculpture that i'd already started i'd started making a kind of um Tin Man robot out of some old plastic bits and pieces that I had around the house, mm -hmm. but I'd abandoned it about two years ago, and it was just sitting there on a shelf. And I thought, I'm going to finish that sculpture. And as the bits that I've used already are just things that I found around the house, in the spirit of lockdown, mm -hmm. I'm going to build something using solely what I can find around my house, garage, garden, greenhouse, and, you know, or if I find it on the floor when I'm out dog walking or mm -hmm. something like that, and it quickly started shaping up that I realised I could make a kind of a memorial figure for the, the way that we used to work, the, the commutes, the crammed offices, the nine to five, the clock watches. So mm -hmm. I built a kind of robotic nine to five businessman, you know, with the, with the archetypal umbrella, bowler hat. Financial um, times. The, the sort of robotic wage slave, just, mm. just stuck to a clock all the time. And uh, the thing I particularly liked about it was I had an old pressure um, valve that used to be on my boiler in the house. <laughs> and when the boiler had gone wrong, that had been replaced. But I kept the old one. And the thing I liked about it is the pressure valve had actually gone and the screws had popped out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to stick that on the front of him to show that, you know, the pressure is so much that it's actually blown the screws out yeah. and the pressure, pressure gauge is stuck on maximum. So... And it really worked well, and that kind of inspired me to think, well, what else can I do? And I ended up producing three of them. Um, that one is a, a sort of strange little stubby-armed alien slug thing mm -hmm. who dreams of being a juggler. He, that sculpture is all about hope. Um, the robot is all about hoping that that way of life is now gone and that people you know, will be allowed to work from home a bit more and yeah. have a better work-life balance and, and things like that. And then there was a third one, which is a multicoloured snowman which was inspired by the fact that I've, on and off over the last 40 years, I've, I've run occasional art classes for people, particularly aimed at people who don't believe that they can create art, because yeah. everyone can, everyone can. And what you invariably find is about, the, the, the courses end up being about 50% tuition, 50% life coaching, <laughs> where you try and give people their confidence back. And usually it's been it's been knocked out of them when they're kids. Like Picasso said, you know, everyone's born, an, every child born an artist, there's the secrets remaining in us as you grow up and and it's true you you spike Milligan said you know you sort of lose sight of the fact you used to be a child and the fact that if you and picasso had been in the same primary school class you would have been turning out comparable work yeah. you carried on and you stopped so um i was told a story about a, a lady who'd drawn a snowman for her rather pedantic father who believes that you know if it's a painting it's got to be something proper it's got to be a landscape or yes. it's got to be a bowl of fruit or something and, and he literally took it out of her hands, threw it in the bin, and showed her how to draw a snowman properly. And it put her, put her off doing art for about 40 years. Yeah. 
Um, I got her back into it. She excelled at it. She was brilliant. And she became one of the official artists for the England Rugby Club. Oh, um, amazing. Eventually. So I made the statue of the multicolored snowman as a kind of tribute to her and as a sort of mascot for the art classes. So each one of the sculptures has a little story behind it. And, and if you go to the exhibition, there's a little plaque in front of each explaining the story. Thank you so much to Stephen Colgan for joining me. My name is Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM. And it's time for a little more music. So we're going to listen to another track by Nick Byrne. We've had him on the show before. And this is his later single and possibly a radio debut. This is Summer Rain by Nick Byrne. <laughs> Just walk with me We'll just see You don't have to sleep All wrapped up And hard to read We won't seek Anything That summer rain Will wash it all away Love talk. Love Wickham Sound. Being a foster carer isn't just about providing vulnerable children a safe home. It's about loving, listening and guiding. It's about changing their lives. If there's space in your home and you have the time and patience, then Nexus Fostering wants to hear from you. We're your local fostering agency, rated outstanding by Ofsted, and we're here to support you in supporting them with full training and a competitive allowance. For a career that really makes a difference, visit nexusfostering.co.uk or call 0800 389 0143. From the 1st of April, your new Buckinghamshire Council will replace the existing county and district councils and continue to deliver all the services Services you are used to. Visit buckinghamshire.gov.uk. Sunday evenings on Wickham Sound. If your idea of a fun festival experience is a mashup of metal, grime, blues, folk, pop, with a smattering of electro, hip hop, Indian grunge, and not forgetting punk, then join me, Paul, for the alternative Wickstape at 11 pm on Wickham Sound 106.6 FM every Sunday. I can even guarantee that the weather will be fine. This is Wickham Sound. 
You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. That was Summer Rain by Nick Byrne. My name is Dane Cobain, and uh, yeah, we're about at that point in the show where I share a few recommendations of entertainment bits and bobs to keep it going. So each week we have a TV show or a movie, an album, and also a book for you to check out. So for this week's TV show slash movie, I'm going for The Mist, uh, the, the movie. There is actually a Netflix adaptation of it as well, which I also quite liked. And it's actually based on a Stephen King uh, short story as well. So The Mist has actually been in my head recently um, because of a meme I saw. Um, basically, it's uh, it's kind of known for having one of the most brutal endings ever, uh, the movie. I think it does actually differ from the Stephen King novel, but um, yeah, it's a cracking little horror film. And in fact, I might re-watch it myself. Um, it's been, been a little while, but it's been dwelling on my mind all week. For this week's album, I'm going to go ahead and recommend Mule Variations by Tom Waits. Um, I guess if you're into Tom Waits, you're into Tom Waits, you know, and most people already have their uh, their favourite albums, but Mule Variations is my favourite of his, um, just because of the sort of the sound for it, it's a very unique sound, um, it's kind of when he was a bit more experimental, although I do like as well when it's just him and a piano, but um, yeah, it's just um, got lots of like, it's got like a farmyardy vibe to it, I would say, and lots of great tunes, including Chocolate Jesus, which is one of my favourite of his songs to play. And for this week's book, it's a bit of a struggle because I've uh, mainly been just trying to tick off the final few unread Agatha Christie books off my list. And so um, I, I don't have, like, I haven't read anything in particular since last week that I would uh, definitely recommend because a lot of these books, are they're good, but they're sort of mid-tier Agatha Christie, all the ones I've left until the end, you know? Um, so instead, I'm going to recommend Guards, Guards by Terry Pratchett. So it's uh, the first of the City Watch books in his Discworld series. It's sort of a comic fantasy series, um, and it kind of holds a mirror up to our own world, and there are some great characters in there as well. And it's got sort of series within the series. And so the City Watch series is my favourite sub-series. But at the same time, you know, you've got your elves and your gnomes and your pixies and your all, all your undead races and all that sort of stuff knocking around in the Discworld. So it's a pretty good entry point if you've never read any Discworld books before, but you've always wanted to. So that pretty much brings us to the end of this week's show. Thank you to Stephen Colgan for being my guest this week and as well to all of the bands and musicians who let me play their music. Uh, we're going to leave you with another track in a minute, but before that, just a reminder, you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. Always looking for local musicians, local artists, and also people putting on events. And also we have a Facebook page so you can find us just by searching for The Art Show Wickham Sound on Facebook. If you miss a show, you can also catch up. We're repeated on Monday nights here on Wickham Sound and you can also find us on iTunes and Spotify and various other sort of podcasty platforms as well so you can listen again there. One final thing I want to share with you guys, this is from Mark Page. He's the guy behind Faces of Wickham and he's posted on Facebook... Do I know any creative writers? I'm putting together a new book of Wickham Through My Eyes, most probably self-published unless I can get a sponsor, featuring my photos from the late 70s to date. I tell stories with my images, but I need help from someone who can convert my background story into written word and create a foreword for the book. If you, th- if you think you can help, please DM me. Eternally grateful, Mark. So I thought I'd give him a little shout out there. He's a very talented photographer and his work is also on display at Wickham Art Centre at the Lockdown Art Exhibition alongside some of uh, Stephen Colgan's sculptures as well. So that is open uh, up until the 23rd of August and it's open Wednesdays from 4.30 to 7.30pm, Fridays from 2pm to 5pm and Saturdays and Sundays from 10pm to 5pm. So as I said, we're going to leave you with a little bit of music here and I am going to leave you with an artist who we listened to uh, last week. So that's Esther Hayes. We listened to um, Seven Stars, which actually that song has been stuck in my head ever since. And uh, this week... We're listening to her track, Swans. So this is Swans by Esther Hayes. I'll see you next week. Will you remember the night? The moon hung low. Thank
could touch us but the cold Will I remember your face As your grip on your bike gave way Take me home to bed The stars will light our way Take me home to bed Wrapped in sheets of pure white gold Forget the words we said Cause the wine has gone to our heads Do you look at me and feel no Cause I know whose hand I hold Take me home to bed The stars will light our way Take me home to bed Wrapped in sheets of pure white gold See your face framed by a new day. Cover me in love, for I've been through hurt too much. Take me home to bed. This is Wickham Sound.